Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we have uh, an exciting um, topic and a very important to topic to many of you. Um, we will be talking about polycystic kidney disease and treatment uh, options for patients with this disease. Uh, we last time we checked, we had about um, 90 uh, registrants who were uh, going to be joining us today. So we know that you are very, very anxious to hear from our speakers. Um, my name is Paula Neves, and I'm the lead for the Center for Living Organ Donation, uh, which was um, launched in 2018 to increase access to living organ donation and transplantation. Uh, you'll be hearing stories from a couple of our patient partners later on, um, but I know that uh, you are very, very anxious also to hear from Dr. Uh, York P uh, Pei, who is a staff nephrologist at Toronto General Hospital, and also who is a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Pei is familiar to many of you. He has done a lot of research in this area. He has presented widely um, on uh, on PKD, and he will be sharing his expertise with you today. Uh, we're also joined by Janet Wright, who is a living kidney transplant recipient, and Claudia Morgan, uh, who's also a living donor kidney uh, transplant recipient. Um, and uh, each will share their stories, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Uh, you can submit your questions via slido.com, and uh, the event code is kidney. So slido.com, event code kidney. Uh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Pei now to uh, start the presentation. Dr. Pei. Okay, thank you, Paula. And hello, everybody. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit and give you an update about uh, the uh, uh, current management of polycystic kidney disease and also uh, a little bit about the uh, uh, direction of new therapy. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of uh, question about different aspects of the disease. So uh, in my talk, I may not be able to cover all, but we can certainly discuss uh, in the uh, Q&A period. Um, so um, ADPKD or autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is the most common inherited kidney disease affecting approximately one in a thousand uh, births and uh, two disease genes called PKD1 and PKD2 respectively cause uh, three quarter and one quarter of the genetically uh, resolved cases. And the distinction between these two genes is important because the prognosis are quite uh, different. Um, from a very simplistic overview um, and ignoring the different types of mutations in each genes, um, people with PKD1 mutation in general will uh, develop end-stage kidney disease about 20 years earlier than people with PKD2. So a very different kind of uh, uh, outlook. And overall, about 5 to 8% of patients who require end-stage kidney disease therapy uh, have polycystic kidney disease. And most ex exciting recently is that we now have a, uh, a treatment, a drug called Tovaptin, which has been approved in multiple countries, including Canada, uh, since about five years ago, uh, which I will uh, say a little bit about uh, later. So I know that uh, a number of you are interested in the genetic aspect. Uh, of this disease. And I just want to show you that the uh, PKD1 and PKD2 genes, and PKD1 is a very big gene and difficult and complex gene to screen from a genetic analysis perspective, but uh, both genes are amenable to mutation screening. And uh, from a number of recent study, um, we now have very good understanding about the uh, effect of the mutation on the disease severity. And before I show you some information uh, about that, I want just to show you the effect of the uh, gene mutation can be uh, broadly uh, kind of categorized into 
how the mutations change the encoded protein. Uh, the two protein that are encoded by PKD1 and PKD2 are called polycystin 1 and 2. And they uh, work as a complex to tell the cell do a number of different functions, including maintaining the geometry in the kidney and liver of the tubules structure and uh, the proliferation of the cells. And when the genes are mutated, it can eventually lead to polycystic kidney disease. And broadly speaking, we can think about mutation that truncate the protein that is cut off the tail end of the protein, which is essential for the interaction with its partner versus non-truncating protein uh, mutation. Um, and uh, those mutation may include change of a single amino acid in a protein or missing or uh, gaining a few amino acids. Um, and the distinction is important because the prognosis uh, vary depending on a type of mutation. So I want to show you that this is uh, some study we have done from Toronto, uh, from the Hereditary Kidney Disease Clinic uh, several years ago. And uh, we studied 220 consecutive uh, patients who have polycystic kidney disease. And from uh, them, uh, we also recruited additional family members who are affected. So in total, 780 patients with varying degree of disease severity. And from that, we learned that uh, patients who have uh, different types of mutation have different prognosis. Uh, on the left-hand panel, you see what is called kidney survival or renal survival. That is the requirement of uh, dialysis or transplant. And on average, 50% 50 patient, 50 of patients with the PKD-PT or protein truncating mutation uh, have, uh, would require dialysis by age of 50 to 55. By contrast to the other extreme is the PKD-2 and the orange line. Uh, half of them would require dialysis at age 80. So very different outlook and many patients in the latter group uh, probably will die of old age and not needing dialysis. On the other hand, a patient with the protein truncating PKD1 mutations uh, often will need dialysis fairly early on. And because of that, it also impact on their survival because once you start dialysis, it cut short your life expectancy due to accelerated cardiovascular complications. So on the uh, right-hand panel, you see patient survival and the blue line have a very different kind of uh, survival compared to the other group. And then there are other types of non-truncating mutation in the purple and green line that vary with intermediate disease severity between the PKD1 protein truncating and PKD2 groups. So, from the uh, mutation, we have a very broad sense of how to place patient in different prognostic group. And um, so, um, however, one of the challenges of using mutation for prognostication is that uh, within the same family, um, and uh, as shown in this graph here, the vertical axis show the age of the individual of the individual family members, uh, uh, that is the different dots within the vertical line, the age of starting dialysis. So you could see one vertical line representing one family. The first one, there are three dots. The first individual who did not require uh, dialysis until late in the 80s, whereas two other younger members require dialysis when they're in the early 50s. And so you can see this kind of variability and what it tells us, and assuming that most of the uh, affected relatives in each family have the same mutation, um, is that there is a very significant modifier effect. And this modifier effect um, is related to 
environmental and genetic factors. And uh, further research is required to understand what these factors are. But using mutation alone probably is not adequate for uh, accurate prognostication. And this is just to show that in a study that we have done um, uh, in our cohort, 12% of the family exhibit this kind of very extreme variation of disease severity within the same family. So um, the modern way of doing mutation analysis now is uh, using high throughput technology. And we actually uh, offer all our patients research genetic testing when they come to see us for prognostication. And we also test about other 50 uh, cystic disease genes or modifier genes that can impact on the disease severity uh, all in one test. Next, I want to just tell you a bit that uh, the way to monitor disease progression is not by looking at the kidney function tests like creatinine or EGFR, many of you are well familiar with. Uh, if you look at kidney function measurement alone, it is highly insensitive to detect uh, progression of the disease until very late in the course. Uh, by contrast, what we now do uh, is to measure kidney volume using MRI serially. And uh, the kidney volume will capture the three-dimensional volume of both kidneys and uh, give a pretty good reflection of the cystic disease burden. And on average, if you look at an adult population um, with polycystic kidney disease, uh, the growth rate of the kidney volume is about 5% per year on average, taking the good and the bad patients together. So that's why the kidney volume in an adult, let's say male, is about 350 milliliter. And in a very severe polycystic kidney disease patient, it could be 10 liter. So a tremendous growth process. And by looking at the kidney volume, um, I'm not able to advance, okay. Uh, by looking at the kidney volume and the age of the individual, we can derive a normal gram uh, that allow us to define different risk group. Uh, the groups that are shown in the orange and yellow line, it says class 1D, 1E, um, are people who have a rapid expansion of the kidney volume. Uh, notice on the vertical axis, this is not a linear scale, it's a log scale. Uh, so, um, and so it, it, it described a very rapid growth process. On the other hand, the dark green and light green line denotes individuals who have very gentle uh, increase in the kidney volume. And these individuals have slow growth rate. And if you look at the bottom graph, uh, which is decline in EGFR or decline in kidney function. Those with the high growth rate uh, shown in the red and uh, goal line have very rapid decline in kidney function versus those with the green and yellow line who have slow growth rate, uh, they decline their kidney function very slowly and generally do very well. And so using this classification, we can put patients into different risk group and using that to select patient before they uh, develop, hopefully like advanced kidney disease to intervene with therapeutic treatment. So I want to just say a few words about new therapy. And uh, because of time, I can only talk about one that is the tovaptan, but there are other experimental treatment, which I will kind of highlight very quickly toward the end. Um, so one of the uh, main defects in polycystic kidney disease is an increase of a messenger molecule, so psychic AMP in the cystic cells, and the increased level make these cells um, do um, things that provoke uh, promote a cystic process. And if you can lower the cyclic AMP level in the cell, uh, and in this case by pharmacological blockade 
of a pathway called vasopressin receptor signaling pathway uh, using a drug, you can lower the cyclic AMP level. Okay, yeah, so here it shows uh, in a mouse model of polycystic kidney disease, uh, you can see the control is the mutant mouse kidney cut in cross section. Um, and uh, it, it's all those empty space assist. Uh, so in an untreated mice uh, with advanced disease, that's what you see. In the same uh, mouse model at the same age, uh, when the mice are treated with this compound called OPC, you can see the cystic process greatly attenuated. And uh, so this is the uh, um, experimental data that kind of suggests that this approach is uh, potentially promising as a new treatment of polycystic kidney disease. Next. So this has led to two landmark clinical trials. The first one is uh, called TAMPO34, testing the drug tovaptin, which is a vasopressin V2 receptor antagonist. Uh, in this study, which is three-year uh, placebo control with over 1,400 patients, tovaptin compared to to uh, placebo, um, and uh, in people with moderately severe polycystic kidney disease, the outcome was the, uh, the expansion rate of total kidney volume. Next. So on the left-hand panel, you can see the red line are the untreated individual over the study period. Um, the slope of that line is um, higher than the blue line, meaning that the growth rate of the untreated patient is higher than the blue line, which is the treated uh, patient. And this difference in growth rate um, is about 50% different. At the same time, when you look at kidney function decline, uh, the blue line are the people treated with tovaptin. They have a less uh, uh, decline rate compared to the red line, a slower decline in the kidney function. Next slide. And then there was a second study uh, called a reprise study, also uh, testing tovaptin versus placebo uh, in a more advanced group of patients with kidney failure, um, more advanced than the, the first group. And again, uh, next, it showed a benefit in delaying the decline of uh, kidney function. Next slide. So uh, these two study, we learned that uh, tovaptin uh, treated over time uh, result in slowing the kidney volume expansion and the rate of decline in kidney function. It also does um, reduce symptoms such as kidney pain, but this is an expensive drug uh, not covered by uh, the uh, usual channel uh, of the public payers in Canada. So uh, usually uh, covered by the patient's private drug plan. And it does have potential toxicity, uh, including liver damage, electrolyte uh, abnormality, and acute kidney injury. But with uh, a monitoring program, the risk of liver damage is really non-existent. Um, so, um, over the past five years, we have treated more than 100 patients with this drug. And I have to say that we are very uh, satisfied with the safety profile. And, and this drug is used for high-risk patients who have um, characteristics such as the PKD1 protein truncating mutation or high total kidney uh, volume for their age. Next. So what is the benefit of tovaptin? It depends on when you start the treatment. If you start the treatment when the kidney function is uh, close to normal, let's say 90, um, then you can get uh, on average about seven and a half year of delay in the need of dialysis. If you start late when the kidney function is 30% and most of the kidneys are scarred, then uh, the, the delay in dialysis is very modest, maybe one year, one and a half year. Uh, so this slide uh, is meant to show that when you have cysts in the kidney, uh, it can cause uh, a broad fuel effect. When a cyst is expanding within the kidney, it actually press on many of the neighboring 
uh, filtering unit called nephron. So even the cis originated from one nephron, it can impair the functions of hundreds of thousands of neighboring nephrons, particularly large cysts. Next. So uh, this is an example on the left-hand side. There's a very large centrally located cyst in the cross-sectional cut of this patient. And, um, uh, and then there are several large cysts on the coronal view on the second patient on the right. You can see uh, they're all in the size of grapefruit, like six, seven, eight centimeter. What happened if you have a technique that allow you to shrink these large cysts permanently decompressing the kidney tissue, would it potentially allow one to slow kidney disease progression? Next slide, please. So this is a procedure we developed called foam square therapy. It's done by our interventional radiologist under ultrasound guidance. The patient is uh, in a prone position. So this patient had large kidney cysts. You can see on the TV screen that those uh, black structure are cysts and they're quite large, generally in the size of an orange or a grapefruit. And uh, using ultrasound guidance and sterile technique, the radiologist would put a drain into those large cysts to be targeted, drain the fluid, and then inject a foam-like chemical to destroy the lining cells, which would otherwise secrete more fluid and re-expand the cyst later. So uh, I want to show you how this procedure is done serially. Next slide. So this is just showing ultrasound. The needle is uh, through uh, one cyst into the second cyst to drain it. And then uh, next slide and then to uh, put in some dye to make sure that there's no leakage within the cyst. Next slide. And the foam is made by in mixing air with this chemical and make kind of milky and, uh, and thickish. And then it's injected into the cyst. Next. Uh, this is one cyst, like uh, uh, the fluid that was drained is about 80 mil. Uh, remember uh, one kidney volume is 120 milliliter. So like this is quite a large cyst. Next, another large cyst, 120 mil. So after injecting the foam and then uh, the patient, the, the foam will be kind of sitting at the bottom of the cyst. Uh, and then the patient will go to the recovery room uh, after the catheter is capped and then basically turn the body one quarter turn every 15 minutes. And then in one hour, the, the cyst will be coated evenly with this foam like material. And then the patient will then return to the radiology suite and the uh, radiologist will remove the um, foam and the catheter. Um, in very big cysts, sometimes we have cysts that are 10 centimeter or even bigger. Um, we would leave the drain in and have the patient come back for a second injection. So this uh, procedure, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is a safety feasibility study uh, uh, of um, about, um, I guess, uh, uh, 35 patients or so. And uh, on the left-hand panel, it showed that the volume before and after three months after the procedure, uh, that there was 21% decrease uh, or twenty two percent decrease in the total the targeted kidney volume so, and and this is permanent effect because three months after there's no re-expansion of the uh, the cyst uh, due to failure. On the other hand, the non-targeted cyst on the right, there's a four point three percent growth rate uh, uh, during the same time. Uh, so we can demonstrate that this procedure is uh, uh, highly effective in selected patients. Next. And this is one example uh, on the top panel is the coronal and cross-sectional view of a very large centrally located cyst. And then after the procedure, uh, three months later, it's gone completely. Next. And you can see in this patient, the kidney function as measured by creatinine clearance actually rose after the procedure from uh, in the uh, high 80s to about close to 110 mil per minute. 
Uh, so in this patient, uh, she clearly benefit from this procedure and improving her kidney function. Next. So we're doing a before and after trial. Uh, I think that uh, to measure more precisely the kidney blood flow, kidney function, and the uh, kidney structures. And, um, and this is a study that we want to um, uh, kind of move forward, but unfortunately due to the pandemic, uh, this is on hold uh, right now. Uh, next. So I think I'm going to end to say that there are other additional um, uh, treatment that are being developed, uh, being tested. So in the future, we hope that there will be more therapy available to slow uh, kidney uh, growth and decline in uh, function. And, um, and uh, so I, I'm going to stop now and then uh, later on we can take up some questions. Thank you. We do know that there are about 3,000 um, patients with end-stage kidney disease that have a PKD diagnosis. And of those, um, there's about uh, 750 on hemodialysis, about uh, 220 on peritoneal dialysis, and the remainder have had a transplant, um, whether it's a deceased donor transplant or a living donor transplant. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've invited uh, two of our patient partners to share uh, their transplant story. And I will turn it over to Janet, who is a member of our uh, center's Patient Advisory Council uh, to uh, talk about her story and um, uh, and Jane Garrett's remarkable gift. So, uh, Janet, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Paula. Our family had uh, polycystic kidney grandfather, father, aunts, and uncles, and um, I was diagnosed in when I was around mid thirties. At that time, our family didn't discuss. Uh, polycystic kidney disease. My parents were very quiet about it. So I just lived my life the way I wanted to do it. Um, I skied, golfed, uh, raised a family of three and had um, a very um, interesting career. When I hit around the 50 year mark, when I was around 50 years old, um, my energy and um, ability to concentrate started to decline. At that point, my medications were changed. I was monitored for blood pressure, obviously creatinine, 24 hour urinalysis, et cetera. And um, I felt pretty good about the process and the care. One thing I did do though, throughout my entire life, the day that I found out I was diagnosed with PKD, I told everybody. I had no reason not to share that I had a hereditary disease. Um, part of the reason for sharing it so uh, outwardly was because my body was changing. I was becoming bigger in the middle and I was very self-conscious about that. So it was almost a justification of why I look different. Um, but um, as, the, as the disease progressed, the cysts increased in, in size and um, I eventually was moved over from uh, uh, my nephrologist over to Dr. Pay's group. At that point in time, I was put on um, tilfactin. And the drug was uh, an interesting drug to be on because I was working and one had to consume or drink, you know, four liters plus of water every day. So needless to say, your work day and your evenings when you're trying to sleep was very dis uh, disrupted. So I tried my best to, you know, monitor when I had, when I consumed the water uh, to minimize any uh, disruption in my, in my lifestyle. Later on, I had uh, some issues with uh, the kidneys. So I went in for the sclerotherapy and I was in one day and out the same day. Uh, I did not have the large cysts whereby I had to, you know, go back in three days time to have uh, more of the home injected into, into the cysts, uh, but it did help a little bit to reduce and minimize some of the discomfort. About three years ago, I really started to go down a slippery slope. Um, the energy decreased. I had kidney brain, couldn't think straight. And um, I received a phone call saying, yep, you know, we're going to start testing you in terms of are you 
able to be a living, uh, to receive a living donor, or the, the next step was, do I go on dialysis? I was determined not to go on dialysis. I did not want to do that. I have an active lifestyle and I, it was just something was, I wasn't prepared to, um, to sacrifice or give up, but I know it could have happened. Going through the, look, the, the seeking for a living donor is very, it's a very sensitive topic for many people. I was blessed um, to have people step up and say, I will sign up and see if I can be a living donor for you, Janet. The profound gratitude of all, just it, the whole process was um, beyond comprehension. What did happen though, is you assume that the first person that, you know, gets quote, um, accepted to be tested to be a donor, it's going to work out. And the first person was my brother, my younger brother. So you figure it was family, it's a shoe in. Well, it wasn't. So he started his testing um, January, February timeframe. And then it was the March, April timeframe where he was told that he was not healthy enough to be a living donor. That process and experience was excruciating. Um, my brother cried. He was devastated. He just thought he was going to be, you know, have the kidney hero to save his, his sister. Um, and then on, on for myself, it was, it's okay. You know, you, we now know you're not healthy enough. So you go up, get off your butt and go and do something and, and take care of yourself. So the hospital then took the second person who offered to be a donor and she went through testing and she was healthy enough to be a donor. However, she wasn't compatible with me. So the junction point there for her was to decide, does she put the kidney into a paired program? And for personal reasons, uh, she chose not to. And that was difficult for both of us for different reasons, but I totally respected her decision. Um, it was her body, her life, and she just wanted to help me being her friend. Um, so we moved on from that. So there was another adjustment in terms of figuring out, you know, who's going to be next um, and will anybody else be um, fit enough to, um, to be a donor. At that point, my kidney function had gone from sort of like here down to whoosh, and I was like around the 15% mark and going down that slippery slope really quickly. So, um, they reached out to the third person who so graciously uh, submitted their application. And it was a dear friend of 30 years. And um, she was uh, incredible. The donor really is the advocate for the recipient. She pushed the timelines with the hospital. She said, you know, I want my, all, most of my tests done in, you know, in one day or two days, rather than um, driving two and a half hours to the hospital for one test and then waiting for the test to another test to happen, you know, two, three weeks later. Uh, she also had a driving force because her son was getting married and she wanted to be healthy and be able to dance at his wedding. So with all that said and done, um, it was beginning of July, I get this phone call and Jeff, stop crying. And Jane says, are you sitting down? And I'm thinking, oh dear, it's, it's, I didn't know whether it was good news or bad news um, because I really did not want to go on dialysis. And she said, I'm a match. So six weeks, seven weeks later, we both went to Toronto General Hospital and on, actually it was August the 26th. And, uh, Jane was um, released three days later on the Wednesday. I went home on the Friday and um, I'd never turned back. It, the, the gift of being a living donor is something that um, as a recipient, you're so humbled and, um, uh, and grateful for. 
you know, in the, the, the processes and, the, and the, the activities with trying to figure out who's going to be your donor is very difficult. So all I suggest um, that everybody's different is don't be afraid about talking about PKD. Don't be afraid to let people know that, you know, you're not well. I had so many people come out and say, ah, you look great. And I'm thinking, boy, if you could only see inside my body what's happening and how I feel. Um, but be your own advocate. And if you're shy, reach out to social media and, and get the message out um, because people are there for you. Uh, but it does take a little work. And um, I want to thank Dr. Pei and his team and the Toronto General Hospital. And most of all, <clears throat> Jean Garrett and her family for supporting her uh, to give my life back and my life back to my family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, I, uh, I know how emotional, um, you know, it, it, it always is when you talk about your story. And I have to say that I also get emotional hearing it. Uh, and you could probably see that uh, it does, um, you know, uh, bring tears to my eyes every time I hear it. Um, I'd like to invite Claudia Morgan to share her story. Um, uh, sh her experience um, yeah, has some similarities, but some uh, differences as well. Um, and uh, probably some in our audience will, um, you know, will identify with some of the experiences of being on dialysis as well. So, uh, Claudia, um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Paula. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, fantastic. Well, hello everyone. Um, as Paula introduced, my name is Claudia Morgan and um, I am a post-op uh, kidney transplant recipient of two and a half years now. And just sort of to explain a little bit about my background and how I came to um, be in the situation that I am now, I should explain a little bit about my background. So I come from a family of PKD as well. Um, on my paternal side. So from a very early age, I knew that I had polycystic kidney disease. Uh, my grandmother, my father, my aunt, and my uncle um, all had polycystic kidney disease. And so I was tested quite early on. Um, I knew that something wasn't right with me from an early stage. Um, but as a young person, you know, you don't really think too much about your health. You just sort of want to enjoy life and have fun and do all the things that young people do. And it wasn't until my 20s that I really started to see my health decline. Um, as Janet mentioned earlier, you start to see your, your abdomen start to distend. And quite early on, um, I started to look like I was about eight or nine months pregnant because my kidneys became so enlarged. Um, so I started seeing a nephrologist in my 20s and I continued to see my nephrologist for about 15 years until the time came when she told me that I had probably about six months to a year before I need to start dialysis. So at that stage, I decided that before I would go on dialysis, I would uh, take a trip um, before it became too difficult to do so. So with the blessings of my nephrology team, I decided to take a trip to Paris, France, and that was in October of 2016. And prior to my, prior to leaving, I did my usual, uh, blood and urine workup and I left for my vacation. Um, I had a fantastic time. Uh, my energy level was a little low, but overall, I did my best to try and maintain, um, you know, the rigors of, you know, sightseeing and everything else that was going on, um, only to come back and find out that I had missed approximately 13 missed voice calls from Sunnybrook Hospital. And they asked me to call them back immediately. And when I called them, they expressed to me that my blood and urine test had shown that my kidney function had dropped to below 10%. So I was immediately rushed to um, get fitted for a fistula. Um, but unfortunately, because I have small veins, the fistula surgery never took, and I was fitted for a port. 
Um, I can say this, that it was not an easy journey. Um, I was very private about my trials and tribulations going through being fitted for a port. Um, I didn't really want to express too much uh, what I was going through. I felt like perhaps people would not understand, but the frustrations of having multiple line changes, having to go on dialysis, having to use cat flow, um, for those who are on dialysis will understand. Um, I decided that I wanted to share my story with my pastoral team. Um, and at that point in sharing my frustrations, my youth pastor um, expressed that we could perhaps put together a video explaining what I'm going through and the fact that I am in, on dialysis and what my life looks like being on dialysis. So uh, Pastor Joel from my church decided that he would make a social media video for me and um, asked me if I would be okay with um, him posting that and sharing it live. And I gave him my blessings and said it was okay. And needless to say, I didn't expect the response that I got. My story was shared multiple times. Um, it eventually, it went from one or two likes to hundreds of likes to multiple people sharing my story. And eventually my story ended up um, reaching a missionary named Valerie in Okinawa, Japan. And when Valerie saw the video, she decided to do a call to action um, from all the Christians that she knew of to view my video and to, you know, volunteer and to put themselves um, basically on the line to be tested to see if they could possibly be donors. And one of those people that stepped forward to be a volunteer was Valerie's own sister, Julia, who was a nurse in Toronto, Canada. So unbeknownst to me, Julia um, went and got tested. And through months of rigorous testing, she reached out to me through social media and notified me that uh, she had, that we were a match. And that, um, you know, that she had been contacted by Toronto General and they were not going to be doing any more testing. And as far as they were concerned, they were going to go ahead and book us for surgery. So in a matter of a, sh a few short weeks, we were prepped and in for surgery. So I was really on dialysis for about a year and a half. So not very long, um, but the surgery went well. And um, both Julia and I are doing extremely well. Um, I now refer to Julia not as my donor, but as my sister. Uh, we share so much in common and um, I can relate with Janet where it is so unbelievably touching to myself to know that someone who I'm not familiar with, a perfect stranger, would put their body on the line to save me. And I'm going to try not to cry. I'm going to try not to cry. But it's so touching because we don't expect someone who is not a blood relation to us or who doesn't know us to want to step forward to do something so kind for somebody else. And so one of the things that I'm very passionate about is sharing my story because it is so important, as Janet mentioned before, to share what you're going through. Um, one of the things that I do now is I volunteer as a TAP ambassador. So basically what that means is it's a transplant ambassador program and I am in Sunnybrook location. And what we do is we are donors and recipients and we are connected with patients who are either in the kidney care centers or in the dialysis units. And we basically share our stories and help offer encouragement to those who may not know what treatment options are available to them and uh, let them know that we can relate to what they're going through because we've been through that similar situation um, as well. And so yeah, I'm so passionate about that and it is something that's near and dear to my heart. And 
as long as I am able to, I will continue to share my story because I think it's so important that as, um, as people who are in need of transplants or are, are going through kidney issues, that they share what their experiences are because by you sharing your experience, you help educate somebody else who is coming behind you. So that's sort of my story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, that was, uh, I know that that is, that is inspiring to many, many in our audience. Um, and um, we've, we did receive quite a few questions. Um, so for those of you who are online right now, please go to slido.com and uh, enter event code kidney. You can upvote uh, the questions that are there now. Um, and while we wait to uh, view those on um, Dr. Pei, um, you know, there are a number of questions about uh, from, from the audience around um, uh, nutrition um, and uh, what um, uh, patients can do before and while they're uh, going through assessment, uh, while they're receiving treatment in order to slow the progression of the disease, if that's possible or for self-care. Um, uh, following um, uh, surgery. Um, is there any advice that you can provide uh, regarding vitamin supplements, regarding a ketogenic diet, um, uh, regarding uh, water consumption uh, that you can provide to the audience? Uh, so uh, typically no specific vitamin supplement other than the usual that you take uh, to maintain good health is recommended. There's no evidence that any of these vitamin supplements would have any impact in slowing PKD. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in dietary manipulation. I didn't have a chance to talk about it uh, because of time limitation, uh, but uh, caloric restriction, uh, which is a very extreme form of dietary manipulation has been shown to slow PKD progression. And um, one of the interesting approach people had been uh, looking at is also a so-called ketogenic diet. There is some experimental data in mouse and rat to support that. But I would just caution that these uh, animal study that had not been replicated and uh, human is quite different. Because of the high prevalence of overweight of obesity, which also is an independent risk factor uh, in promoting progression of PKD. I think that uh, um, a healthy diet um, that allow you to lose weight to get to your ideal weight, um, I think would be highly recommended, but there is no evidence to uh, say that that will slow PKD progression. Uh, and uh, so I think one have to be careful not to extrapolate too much from some of the animal study. Um, it is quite uh, of interest that people are looking into a form of um, caloric uh, dietary manipulation called intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding, uh, the simply uh, simply uh, kind of uh, explaining this is just that uh, you would eat, let's say, from 11 a.m. till 7 p.m. Uh, you can eat three meals, four meals, and uh, um, but the rest of the time outside this period, you just have water, tea, or nothing sweet and no food, but uh, mainly fluid, and you could have some soup and... Um, this kind of time restricted uh, fasting allow you to uh, potentially achieve a similar kind of benefit like caloric restriction, but much more reasonable uh, than caloric restriction. Uh, and the type of food you eat during that time period is also important. And I think the current recommendation is to really minimize, we should cut back uh, a lot of the starchy food or carbohydrate increase uh, the good fatty food and the good fatty food would be things like uh, olive oil, uh, non-salted nuts, um, plain yogurt, uh, maybe some cheese. 
and uh, fish has a lot of uh, fish oil as well. So like uh, you could have canned salmon with salad, olive oil, avocado also have very good uh, type of fat. And so I think, um, but not trans fat. Uh, so if you have a higher fat, lower carb type of diet and generally normal protein intake, avoiding red meat and maybe more on the fish side, white meat. Uh, I think that uh, coupled with the um, time restricted feeding um, would have very little risk to your health. Um, definitely would help you quite a bit in maintaining your ideal weight and uh, potentially may have some benefit in slowing PKD, although the research has not done in, in human. Uh, so I think that's probably kind of a capsule of uh, the kind of current dietary maneuver. So this would be considered experimental therapeutic at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Pei. And in terms of water consumption, there's, there seemed there were also a lot of questions in the registration form um, about uh, you know the, how how frequent, how much water should be consumed, whether that has a preventive effect. So uh, it's based on the action of tovaptan. Tovaptan block the kidney's ability to concentrate urine. And when the urine is very dilute, like throughout the day and uh, persistently uh, over a long period of time, it can suppress the cyclic AMP, that uh, second messenger molecule that I mentioned that promote a cis growth process. Um, whether you could actually mimic that due uh, the drug effect is unclear. And, um, but we generally recommend three liter of water as a start. Uh, and so you would have at least three liter of urine, uh, generally somewhat diluted, but not as diluted as you would be taking tovaptan. Uh, but uh, we hope that this would have some kind of partial benefit and um, uh, but there is no uh, uh, evidence in human uh, definitively showing that is the case. But I think there's very little downside, so we we would recommend that. Uh. Uh, thank you. And um, since you raised uh, tolvaptam as um, as you know as as part of the therapy, and you did cover it as well in your in your presentation, are there elements of your presentation you didn't get to? Um, you know, experimental treatments. Um, additional information that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, so I think that the, given that this is a transplant oriented uh, audience, uh, so the kidney and liver transplant uh, due to polycystic kidney disease, and we didn't really talk about liver. Uh, so um, a small percentage of patients with polycystic kidney disease, mostly, mostly in women, um, will have severe polycystic liver disease and the liver will be in a range of five to 10 times the normal size, making the abdomen severely distended. And um, the cystic disease in the liver generally does not cause liver failure, but what it does cause is a mass effect. So it makes you feel like you're permanently pregnant. And so it's, really significantly impact on quality of life. And rarely it can also cause hype, portal hypertension and causing other complications such as varices and uh, esophageal varices and bleeding. But by and large, the, the main complication from polycystic liver disease that is severe is mass effect. Because these patients do not exhibit uh, sign or symptoms of liver failure. Um, they do not get to go on the transplant list um, in any kind of priority. In fact, they are disadvantaged um, because people with liver failure will go on the list. So um, it is very hard to get them a transplant. But with the uh, living donor uh, liver transplant now, so we have a few patients who had some success in getting 
other people to donate the liver, uh, one lobe of the liver for them. And, um, and I think in some of the patients, particularly um, who, are very, who are relatively young and they really impacted on the quality of life, uh, liver transplant uh, can be uh, considered and, uh, as a, a potential therapy. Um, thank you for that. And um, I do see on the screen uh, questions about the, the COVID vaccine. We will um, come back to, to that question in a minute, but uh, just as a follow-up. Um, in terms of transplant, uh, when is um, a discussion of preemptive transplant, uh, you know, um, best had? Uh, it, does that, uh, it, you know, uh, we know that there are many who uh, hopefully will never progress um, to, to um, the, uh, the need for, for a transplant or the need for dialysis. Uh, but for those who progress, uh, when, when does that discussion about preemptive transplant happen? So generally, we would initiate that when the patient's uh, EGFR is maybe 20% normal. So um, when you get down to 10% normal, most patients are uh, very close to needing dialysis. For preemptive transplant, uh, you're getting a live donor, uh, and it may be more than one donor that had to be worked up before you find someone who's suitable. So you want to have a good window of time um, because if your timing is too rushed, you may miss the um, opportunity for a preemptive transplant before dialysis and you may be actually forced to start dialysis then transplant. So you want to give yourself extra time to, for the workup because uh, just sometimes things uh, that take certain time may take longer in, uh, in specific cases. Uh, so I think that when the kidney EGFR is about 20%, I think it would be a reasonable time to, to start the conversation and uh, exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, the COVID vaccine is obviously on the minds of many um, who have PKD um, and who or, or who uh, have gone on to have a transplant. I know that you've uh, done some presentations on this topic, that the P PKD Foundation has been very active. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, the what we are beginning to learn about the uh, about the impact of COVID and uh, and uh, the COVID vaccine. So I don't see any contraindication for the vaccine for PKD patients. And uh, the question you have, I, there may be a misconception there and uh, it does not damage the kidney per se. And uh, there's no evidence the vaccine itself would be deleterious to patients with polycystic kidney disease. Uh, the, the question would be at what stage would the vaccine be um, perhaps less effective. Um, and there is a potential concern that um, a patient who had organ transplant during the initial few months when the immunosuppression is very intense, getting the vaccine, you may not develop immunity because of the depressed immune system. So in fact, you want to vaccinate early rather than late. And uh, in patients who are um, going to have a transplant, you want to vaccinate before you get the transplant rather than after the transplant. And, um, um, and I would encourage all of you to consider getting the vaccine. There's really no downside. Most of the side effects are minor. Um, there are more severe allergic type of side effect, but that is not specific for people with PKD. It's more specific to an allergy to uh, a uh, substance um, called polyethylene glycol or PEG, which is a, a form of antifreeze used in two of the mRNA vaccines. Um, so it's very rare. It's about the incidence is probably one in 100,000 people and it's highly treatable and it will be picked up uh, right after you have the vaccination. You have to be staying for at least 15 years, uh, sorry, 15 minutes before you leave the uh, vaccination center. 
and people who are allergic to this will manifest during the time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Pei. So uh, we've reached the end of our webinar. I want to uh, thank um, everyone who attended. We've got a, a couple of upcoming events that may be of interest. Uh, one is a follow-up to our vac vaccine Q&A, uh, which is a webinar that is, uh, the recording is archived on the center's YouTube channel. And the next one is on the 29th and we welcome your questions. We also have a follow-up uh, webinar um, that uh, will look at diabetes and kidney disease. Um, so I'd like to end by thanking our, um, our, our presenters, Dr. York Pei, uh, Janet Wright, and Claudia Morgan for sharing their stories, and Dr. Pei for sharing his expertise. Um, if, you've, uh, if you know of anyone who would benefit from viewing this, this, um, this content, uh, there will be a recording of this event uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, which is um, uh, um, the URL is bit.ly uh, give life U H N Y T. You can access it if you go to any of our social media sites or to livingorgandonation.ca. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.